<clears throat> well, thanks for uh, stopping in tonight for our, uh, I believe, our, our 11th, 11th Journal Club, or maybe 10th. Uh, and tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about the rain maze Venus complex in uh, Mesoamerica and in the American Southwest. The two papers uh, we're going to be looking at is Paul A. Shafma's uh, Morning Star Rain Maze Complex in the American Southwest and Ivan Sprock's earlier Venus Rain, Rain Maze Complex in the Mesoamerican world. Um, going to focus a little bit more on the uh, Southwest paper. Um, Sprock's paper is is pretty long. It prints out at 55 pages, and I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure not everybody read it start to finish. Uh, and it's only the first half, really, of, of a longer work that, that grew out of his uh, master's thesis. So we're going to be touching on that. It's, it provides good um, a good framework for the conversation. Uh, that's why I, I chose to pair those two together. Um, and it really is a, a tour de force of, of Venus in Mesoamerica. But we're going to just dip in and out of it a little bit and, and maybe take some detours. Let me see what's going on here. So uh, pulling from, from, uh, from the first paper, uh, we have the, the conversation of, of Quetzalcoatl as the Mesoamerican manifestation of Venus, or at least one of them, or, or a prominent manifestation of Venus. And um, an analogy is made between Quetzalcoatl and these two Hopi deities. Um, I would certainly probably get the pronunciation wrong, but <clears throat> the two of them together seem to like for, form um, the, the same uh, role that Quetzalcoatl takes in Mesoamerica. And, and she says in here, well, hinder, hinting at the fragmentation that takes place in the process of peripheralization of Mesoamerican co concepts adopted for simple farming and communities. That's how, um, how, how this uh, splits out into the two, into the two different deities. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, Sprock, on the other hand, says one of the best known facts is the god Quetzalcoatl was related to Venus on one hand and to rain, maize, and fertility on the other. The feathered serpent was a mythical creature which, from the remote past, represented celestial water, clouds, and also the rainy season. So this picture here is uh, something I pulled from, from uh, Teotihuacan, <laughs> which um, flourished about uh, 500 AD peak and uh, was very influential to, to the Maya lowlands. And they had a Playlock uh, Venus warrior cult that uh, we think originated from there and and um, and then Trotta went into um, to call in, in, the, in the Maya lowlands and possibly even was instrumental in setting up Copan down at the Honduras. But it's a, it's a concept that dates back even further from than the Teotihuacan on the bottom right is a drawing of the Laventa Monument 19, um, the Olmec, Olmec carving, which uh, dates about 1400 to 400 BCE, sometime in there. It's the, the very first and rudimentary image of the feathered serpent, serpent that we you know, know about. So the best we can put together is that <clears throat> the feathered serpent originated somewhere on, on the, uh, in the Olmec territory along the coast, it was adopted then by Teotihuacan, which strongly influenced uh, the Maya and, and the Aztecs much later, and then worked its way up north. And that's pretty much uh, the beginning of, of you know, what we're going to talk about. 
uh, the conversation in the paper turns quickly towards um, similar similarities in the iconography. And so I want to start with uh, the, the Maya glyphs for Venus. So the top three are basically the uh, Maya glyph for Lamat, which, which is one of the 20 sacred days in the Maya Tzolkin calendar. Uh, but it also represents the planet Venus. And uh, it's typical of this, this cross with the, the four dots around it. It comes in various incarnations. Um, you can see it in sky bands, in Maya ceramics, in dates, uh, important dates. For Venus, you know, almanacs often start with Lamont. And um, the other, the other glyph is uh, red as ek, and it's kind of, uh, it, it's, it can be glossed as both star or Venus, you know, as the great, great star. If it's prefaced with chalk, which can mean either red or great, chalk ek would be a great star. But um, unadorned, it's, you know, you know, it, it really could depend on context, either be Venus or just star. And the, the symbol, as you can see from looking at the one above it, is really just a half a Lamont. It's just, you know, either the lower half or in this incarnation, maybe perhaps the upper half. But uh, in iconography, they can mean the same thing, they both mean star. This, uh, here we see the Venus glyph above a shell. This is um, accepted as a as a, a war glyph. Typically, uh, the star of a shell or star of a city means that the, that city was attacked and uh, calls back to ritual warfare that was, you know, uh, timed around the Lyical rise of Venus. This is a cartouche that's above a painting in Bonapak in. In the, along the Asumacinta River. Linda Schiele, uh using uh, astronomical calculations based upon the date uh, and the way the sky was shaped on that date, uh, came, you know, decided that this was Saturn. But unfortunately, the date was wrong that she used. And uh, we have a, a more recent and better reading of the, of the date. I ran the same thing through astronomical software and this guy is clearly clearly Venus <clears throat> and we'll see that uh, it makes much more sense too uh, contextually uh, we have the, the guy here spearing uh, the adjacent cartouche so I, I put this in here because it's very important with him spear so we're moving on to our, our first paper one of the things that she she draws upon is is the iconography in the in the Hopi um, artwork and 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 products that that definitely call back to similarities in the Mesoamerica. So here we see two different versions of of our Lamont glyph. This one's a this one's a pretty clear representation. Here you can see we've got the Lamont. Lamont star. And then we have four little stars instead of our circles. But other than that, it's a remarkable similarity considering the, the distance in geography and time. You know that that's that separates these two cultures. Here we have the the same thing. We have the uh, four cornered center of the Lamont symbol um, in the center part of this Hopi Hopi wand. <clears throat> the wand actually pretty much pulls together the entire conversation of Venus rain maze complex that's being discussed in both papers. We have the rain clouds at the top, the uh, the symbol the symbolic uh, Venus right here in the middle, and then and the maze crop that we can see here. And then of course on this guy we have you know the maze growing out of the bottom with the, the rain. <clears throat> Venus. Amazing. So, any questions on this? 
before we move on? Any any comments, questions? I don't want to. Yeah, Chris. So one, one thing I would ask, um, and you, you, we've gone from the, the, the Mayan and the Aztec, uh, and even Olmec, uh, to the Hopi. Um, but what about the Chaco period? Is there an intermediate thing in Chaco? And of course, there's there's quite a, a bit of ethnography about the connections. I'm just wondering if if, if the iconography appears at Chaco. Um, I would have to, I would have to look into that. I mean, my Chaco and sources would really be you and Dr. Monroe and, and Kim. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think if I've, I've run across anything. Well, the person to ask might be uh, Jane Colbert. Who has run the the uh, rock art survey i think through three iterations now and is just turning it over to somebody else but but jane's in arizona and could be a wonderful resource if we wanted to uh to explore this i i love the way you're talking about it this is this is a, a brilliant presentation and I, i'm wishing that jane was on hmm. yeah it would be very interesting i mean uh Polly makes some references to hopelcom art and i i have seen uh similarities in in the hoho gum I, nothing comes to mind uh in the chaco area but that certainly doesn't mean that it's not there it just means that yeah yeah it, it's, it, it, at the moment yeah it's not there in the areas i've done research uh th this iconography but uh it may well be there and uh i'm uh, i might be befuddled with other images i've seen from other rock art studies so i don't want to a tribute yet, but uh, but thank you. Uh, if if you like, I'll I'll, I'll touch base with with Jane and and yeah, that would, be, that would be great. Hello. Hello. Take care. Hello. Have a good day. You're welcome. Um, the other the other image I just dropped down here in the bottom was was also from the same paper. It's a nice representation of kind of the same theme that we have. To, oops, from, of, the, of the same theme we have going. And I just put in there that caption, the stars were considered uh, scalpers. Um, I think I think the mention was in the Eastern Pueblo that they they were um, viewed suspiciously and and as 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 bad. And a lot a lot of that also um, comes from both uh, a Mesoamerican pre-classic and colonial. Mindset, if you remember the uh, the colonial Maya and, and their Spanish overlords called uh, Venus Lucifer, of course. <clears throat> so, um, not in the papers, but I want to I want to just delve a little bit more into into Venus. I mean, this is this is well outside of the papers that we were talking about, <clears throat> and they they both, of course, mentioned the Dresden Codex Venus Al Almanacs. I don't know how familiar people are with, with the Almanac. It's actually six pages long, but the first page is, is different than the rest of these pages. First page is more of an owner's manual, tells you how to enter into the Almanac and how you can reuse it uh, over and over again. But I just want to talk about, uh, talk about it a little bit, even though it wasn't part of the reading because you know, because it is probably, you know, a high point, if not the high point in, in print contact, you know, indigenous astronomy. And so this is it. And I'm going to, I'm going to just go into this a little bit deeper. I don't want to go too deep, but if anybody has questions or like, like to a little bit more, just let me know. So these are the five pages. Um, of the actual almanac, like I said, there's a six that comes first, and we're gonna look at how it was used, and then we'll use the last page, which is on page 50, really, of the whole trust, just to, to dig in a little deeper. So, the uh, the Maya were uh, well aware of the, the commensurate nature of Venus. The Venus period in relationship to the solar year. 
that five Venus periods uh, was commensurate with eight solar years. So it, it pretty much lines up. Um, and, you know, and is, you know, one of those remarkable coincidences of nature that they latched onto and, and made it a very important part of their, you know, their cosmology. This is a drawing that uh, Anthony Avini did. If you were actually watching the motion of Venus on the horizon on its first Venus year or you know Venus period, this is it would be its arc across the sky, and on its second it would look like this. Its third appearance, its fourth, and its fifth, and going through this. Which Five. which way which way are we looking, Chris? What are we looking uh, east or west? I think he drew this looking east. I believe. Thank you. Yeah, it says on the bottom there, east. So, uh, oh, well, I, that's me. <laughs> I just okay. did that. I would. I would. Uh, I, I think he did it east, but I wouldn't put my. Uh, I wouldn't bank on my Stellarian choice of image. But these five cycles occur over an eight year solar, eight year, a period of eight solar years. So the five Venus cycles commensurate with the, with the eight years. And then after that, it would start over again. So after 24 years, we would run through this period five times. So the nice thing is if we. Hello, can I get started for you? If I could do the box. Okay, for you, Jake. Um, let's do a unsweetened iced tea. Uh, look, could you uh, uh unsweet? Look, okay, could you please it? mute your phone? <laughs> Thank you. So um, so the Venus, the five pages of our Venus almanac. If we take, if we take our uh, five periods or five Venus cycles, they line up pretty nicely. Um, one cycle per page. So the way that this would be read is each each one of these lines here that I drew down the middle. I think well, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Yeah, of course. There's 13 rows of, of token days. And then there's five columns. So there's 13 rows across, five columns down. The way this is read is that uh, this, this top glyph, of course, is gone. You know, it, it's completely eroded. But we would, we would start at this day and we would read down the column. And then once we were done, we would go to the next glyph at the very top and we read down that column and we do three and then we do four and then we have five and then we go to this whole cycle again until we got to the very end and then we'd start back here on row two with the next date and we go down the column so a, com a complete cycle through the almanac 13 times would represent a 104 year cycle now the beauty of the table is that it could be reused over and over again and with just a little bit of adjustment and that page that i'm not showing here that i called the element manual is the page that would show you how to do those adjustments um any questions here before before i moved on i have a question sure on these cycles are is it referencing the 584 day cycle of venus are you familiar with that yes that's exactly what it's so is box one 584 days or one through five is 584 days? Well, the, it's the 584 days uh, is one is one run through the site through the through the table, right? Because that's the same as eight years. Five. Right. Wait. No. 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 Wait. <laughs> Hold on. I got. Let Let me come back. Let me come back. It, it's It's one page is what we're talking about, and it'll it'll that'll come clear in my next slide. Actually, sorry about okay, that. Okay. Cool. Thank you. 
our, my slide after this slide. So this, this I told you we're going to look at the last page, and we're going to look at this one in a little bit deeper. Um, it's page fifty. So we, I, I said there are five columns here, right? And the first four columns are red from the very top all the way down to the bottom. And then we start over and we go all the way down. And we do that um, all the way across all five pages 13 times. Um, each of these columns represents a phase in the Venus cycle. So we have four phases in the cycle. Each one represents that. And then we get to the fifth one. And the fifth one is when all hell breaks loose, right? So we got these phases and then we have the heliacal rise of Venus. And the whole second half of the page is dedicated to the heliacal rise of Venus. So we're gonna, we're gonna take it apart and, and look at it a little closer. So the first column on page 50, that's read down, of course, recall that, you know, the, our first glyphs are eroded. But this represents um, um, Venus as the morning star. So if you look at the very bottom of this, this uh, row, I don't want to go too deep, but the, the, the Maya used uh, the decimal uh, counting system, which is base 20. So this is actually a bar is five and a dot is one. So this is actually 16, but it's in the 20s column, right? No, I'm sorry. That was, that was, this is 11 in the 20s column. And then we have five, 10, 15, 16 in the ones column, right? So this is adds up to 236 days. So Venus is in this position really 263 days. The Maya, the Maya said it was 236. Uh, they weren't wrong. They knew better. The, there were reasons why they did it though. And they were numerical reasons, numeral, uh, numerological reasons. They were pulling in bigger cycles than just Venus. They were pulling in cycles of the sun, of the moon, and, and to make all the bigger cycles work, you know, they 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 fudged this a little bit. But on the first reading, it would have a consulting date, and then it would come down here, and it would say on ten uh, Conkeen, the maze god who is Venus, aimed his darts to the north. So the verb. Uh, is a verb uh, that you would use uh, sometimes translated as knocked, as if you would take like a bow and arrow and you would take the arrow and, and knock it into a string. They were using atlatls and in the um, iconography, and that's where the verb came from. And then we have a cumulative total of days, uh, seven to twelve, which is actually you know two thousand five hundred seventy-two days in the decimal system. And then it gives us, you know, kind of position on 15 Kumku and or uh, zero Yashkin, who know how, whose Venus was fed in the east. So we have positional information. We have um, auguries because really this was an astrological table. And then, you know, we have how long this was, was in uh, the, the morning star phase of its cycle. And as it progressed, we got to the second column, which uh, was superior conjunction, column two. And here, uh, Venus, who has uh, knocked his darts to the west, he's God L. Uh, the maze god was fed in the north, and he was there for 90 days. He observed days up there is 50. But then, you know, we, we discussed that. I mean, they knew it was 90. They put 50. They had their own reasons. And then the next, the next column, third column, um, is when we have uh, the evening star manifestation. And here we have uh, our date on five mock uh, which is God 19, is being as he knocked his darts to the south. So it's kind of telling us positional information 
uh, our cumulative total, you know, from we added 90 days to our last count. And then it says um, on 10 Kayeb or 15 Zek, God out whose Venus was fed in the West is 250 days. Uh, and then after that, we have our fourth column, column four. We come all the way through here. We have our date, our positional information, and then we have eight days. So we have eight days of invisibility. Um, that one they that one they kept right on. And then the, after the eight days of vis invisibility at um, <laughs> for conjunction, then we have the heliacal rise of Venus. And that's a big deal. <clears throat> so the top section here in these columns, and every page is laid out the same, but um, it has different information. So here we can re recreate the date um, three whole, who know who is uh, presiding over, over the scene. In the east is the morning star at the hearth stone, could be, could be you know, in, in Orion. That's a, that's a different story. Lord Sun is the authority of the day and the authority of the year. The omen is an abundance of food and water this year. The omen concerns maize. Of course, it's most all of it concerns the maize. There's a picture of the maize god right here. You can tell from his uh, foliated head and Hunahau presiding over this Halaika rise. And this is all one section. And then we have these two sections here with, with our caption and our picture. Here it says the Adelatl or the dart is, is knocked to the east. And here we have uh, a Mexican god that has come across in our readings. Um, particularly, uh, Sprock talks about him as a manifestation of, of Venus. And he is the, the central Mexican god of frost. And he's wielding the power of Venus or he is Venus, depending how you read it, you want to read, he is Venus, or he's wielding the power of Venus in, in the form of these, these darts or spears. He's the great star. The stranger from another kingdom, God Q, is the speared one. And he's down here. The god is buried, the lord of the succession is buried, the main god is buried. So here we have a picture of our Mexican god of frost. And um, every column as the gods presiding. It has a god who's in the role of Venus, spearing another deity. So it's always Venus or a Venus manifestation or somebody using Venus to spear an enemy. 10 in a 30 day, 10 days into a 30 day lunar month. Two blue skies buried, the white cotton armor is buried, the strange from another kingdom is buried in the west. And there's his picture. So every page follows the same formula. And here's our God that we just talked about. Um, it's all Kohli, Kohu, Kohli. My, my Nawadal's a little off once I get past six syllables. But here he is, he's blindfolded as we read in the paper, in our, in our paper. He's got his darts and we can find his equivalent in our in our Hopi warrior deity that um, that's talked about in the first paper, who's who's hur hurling darts by the spear. Um, so to Kwanangu, if I'm saying that correctly, is uh, the god associated with with cold and with ice, same as our frost guy over here. Uh, he hurls lightning bolts and spears and darts. Uh, he's associated with fertility and the maturation of maize. And here we have our Lamat symbol as his head. We have uh, all the quills, the arrow. Uh, it, you know, it's a little more rudimentary form on the rock art, but uh, the major, the major iconography is there. Then of course his his other half. Uh, I'm not saying at all that this is a picture of Potos or however you say that, but he's also a Hopi ice man Kachina from the San Francisco mountains. So the iconography, um, the star, 
the darts. Look, here we got. We'll come back to that in the next slide. But um, it's all seem it all seems to be there. Any questions there? So here's here's um, a page from uh, a, a different Venus Almanac. It used to be called the Galier Codex. Now it now it's commonly called the Mexicanus Codex. It would have been originally a 20 page manuscript <clears throat> with um, each one of the columns, each one of the, so each one of the four, first four columns on a page of the Dresden would have been its own page in the Mexicanus. So we would have four columns and then a holiacal rise. Each of those four columns would be represented with its own page here. And <clears throat> you can see very similar to uh, the Tewa petroglyph from our paper with the sun shield and uh, the quill of arrows, the Lamont Venus sign. Here, here we have a whole bunch of Lamont dates. So this, this iconography not only um, ended up with the Hopi, but it ended up in the Eastern Pueblos as well. And then <clears throat> Sprock in particular talks about this guy. Um, I'll take a shot at it. Plawitzkal Pante Chutli who's a manifestation of Venus um, as, uh, as Morningstar. He was a feared Aztec deity. And uh, here we have, you know, his spear. He's spearing a woman here who's actually in the water. Um, Carlson noted that this god had a, a skull with the same headdress as himself attached to the back of his head, relying on evidence from my area, Carson argued that the skull represents the evening star in that, at least in central Mexico at the time of the conquest, he was a god of both aspects of Venus, which also agrees with common in the codex. So one of the things that uh, I also want to point out, well, you know, here we have, we have a similar shield with the arrows. We have um, another interesting bit of iconography here. If you look at his headdress, uh, you'll see that there's uh, five of these elements, which, you know, if you if you look at it, you can see that really uh, could line up to the five pages of the Dresden Codex are these five Venus uh, periods, which are commensurate with, with uh, eight solar years. And of course, these are these are dates. So I pointed out that he had five of those on the top of his head. Here we have a roof ornament from central Mexico. Same kind of thing. We have the Tlaloc uh, goggle eyes that go all the way back to Teotihuacan. And we have these five uh, temple-like structures across the, the top of his head. These pictures come from, from our paper. <clears throat> these are drawings from vessels from uh, Western Mexico that point out these five flints um, across the top of the head, just like we saw in the last picture, uh, interspersed with these eyes. And in uh, Mesoamer Mesoamerica, eyes are representative of stars. So you'll see that a lot when they, they want to depict stars or the idea of stars or looking at something. Uh, it's going to be concentric circles or eyeballs, something similar. Here we also see uh, five flints interspersed with stars or eyeballs. And here, uh, the Rio Grande Star pet petroglyph, we, we see the outlines of one, two, three, four, five, the same thing. So she's making the point that this is this is actually a motif that has been brought up as well from, from the South. 
Um, I'm just going to pause, you know, for other people's input at this point. I don't want to just barrel through and do all the talking, but any questions or comments? When, when you say what? Central Mexico, do you mean Aztec or Mayan or, or neither? Well, the Maya aren't considered Maya. The Maya, I would say separate. Um, but Me Central Mexico has a, a long tradition. Uh, that the that the Aztec were really the final culmination of. Yes. So, so you recall Teotihuacan was was early on, and uh, after Teotihuacan fell, other other city states like Xochicalco mm -hmm. and and Tula, you know the Toltecs. These these cultures rose to prominence in the vacuum of Teotihuacan's demise. And then eventually, of course, the, the Aztecs migrated, the, the Mexica mi migrated south and formed the Triple Alliance and, and took that. So when I say Central Mexico, I mean all of it. The Aztecs, the Zapotecs, the Mixtec, um, here the Western Western Mexico, uh, <laughs> probably kind of fringe, because I, I usually I would usually use the term Central Mexico. Look at the Valley of Mexico, and there were lots of different cultures that rose and, and fell in that that period. Of course, the Aztecs, the Aztec uh, being the last and, and most famous. So, but uh, these these wouldn't necessarily be Aztec drawings, nor nor is this. But they share their they share so much iconography and so much cosmology that we can safely use the term central mexican and so we have we have cultural traits that define mesoamerica and you know those are different you know and the maya and the aztec are very different cultures but they share these mesoamerican traits and you know which kind of go up to almost Pequime, which is kind of like half mesoamerican maybe but you know they revolve around mostly this you know this venus maze uh rain complex along with you know the ball game um their religion is very much maze based what's there a, a venus watcher like there would be a sun watcher in hopi well <clears throat> those would be those would be uh elite people i don't know if we have you know, after the conquest, I don't know if we, we know the answer to that per se. Today, there's there are certainly uh, people called day counters who um, you, you can go to the day counter and, and, you know, they'll get insight using the sacred calendar to you know, make prognostications. But as far as who who was watching Venus, that's that's hard to say. We don't really know because there's a, a cultural disconnect, I think. Um, what I can tell you is that the Venus almanacs that we looked at were uh, originated from northern Yucatan, where we also have a lot of the um, architecture that's aligned to Venus, which I'm going to talk about right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned Tikal earlier. Is that is that also figure in this? Well, Tikal does not have any architecture that aligns to Venus. Um, Tikal, after after the the pre classic collapse, Tikal uh, emerged as one of the bigger players, and uh, there were two big players: Tikal and Kalakmul. Early in Tikal's career, an entrada from Teotihuacan came down from, you know, central Mexico, marched through the jungle, and ended up at Tikal on a peaceful mission. Uh, the next day, the king of Tikal was dead, and the representative of the entrada was now the new king of Tikal. Hmm. So how peaceful it was to, for that coincidence to happen, who knows? Remarkable, yes. Right, but there was no open warfare. <clears throat> and then, um, 
the name of the guy who led the Entrada actually was then uh, shows up as the founding king of Copan, just just um, to the south. Mm. And interestingly, these these um, cities that were tied to Teotihuacan and, and used uh, titles like uh, Culemte, which would be um, <clears throat> Lord of the West or something like that, um, power of the, of the West, were uh, affiliated in somehow in some way with Teotihuacan, like um, to call Palenque, Copan, and we have no evidence of any interaction between Teotihuacan and the other superpower, Kalakmul and Kalakmul's allies, such as Caracol and. Uh, you know, lots of cities flip back and forth, like Naranjo and Tiragua. They, you know, they really didn't stay loyal to the to their patrons. But there were really, there was really this two sides to warfare. It's like who who are you gonna whose side are you gonna be on? And I'm not gonna go as far as to say that it was based upon you know any acquisition, you know any any bending of the knee to Teotihuacan, but. It seems at least not beyond the realm of possibility. Mm -hmm. So Teotihuacan, I mean, to call, I'm sorry, to call did not actually show much um, alignments to Venus. A lot of that actually came a lot later, the very end of the classic period, after to call was a big player, or even in post classic period. And uh, one of the main architectural forms, and it depends, it depends who you talk to or who you listen to. Sprock, who's the author of one of our papers, talks about here El Circular at uh, Cuesloatla in Mexico and how the, the site was built in two phases that, that don't share the same alignment. And this earlier phase points off to the, the Pico Trace Mountains on the horizon, and this aligns with the northernmost, um, more than northernmost appearance of Venus as an evening star. And then you can see here, this is this is dropped. Out, this is pulled out of his paint, his second paper. Um, you know, rain, Venus rain maze complex part two. Uh, an interesting fact that he he states is that it's not symmetrical, right? If you see here, um, in the west, the extremes of Venus are significantly beyond the solstice set points, where in the east, they are not significantly off from the solstice rise points. So that's going to be uh, an important little bit later on. Here's a, here's a circular temple, too, from, from Cibola in Guatemala. It's also a little bit later, I think, because right near the stela was, or, or the circular temple, where there's a stela with um, actually Quetzalcoatl on it. Is, is it clear what the mark point, the marking points are? Is on it, this one? Is it unambiguous? You, you're mentioning a, a actually quite significant. It looks like four or five degree offsets here. I'm just wondering uh, how how well we can establish the, these are the, the meaning of the marks. You mean on on this one on El Sofiola? I can't speak to the circular temple at Cibol. Okay. Because I don't okay. think that has any defining defining things like this one does. Mm -hmm. This one, uh, this one takes into account um, two things that most, uh, at least Central Mexican uh, sites of archaeostrom archaeoastronomical interests do. They usually align to both um, a sacred mountain peak and something uh, astronomical that's happening there, which leads us to believe that that's why that site was chosen in the first place. Mm -hmm. And this one in particular is the northern uh, most extreme set of the evening star. I, how big, I, I, how big I, are these structures? I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm asking too many questions. No, 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 not at all. 
how big are the structures? I'm not sure. Well, here's here's a apart from this here, you know. Oh, okay, 20 meters. I would say right. maybe 15 meters. Okay, yeah. All right, it's good. It, it's sizable. It, it's quite considerable. A little smaller than Casa Um, I have a question. On the offset between the solstice setting positions and Venus, uh, do you know how many degrees difference that is? Not off the top of my head, but if you're interested, I would direct you towards Brock's second paper. Uh, or actually, even the first paper, I think you mentioned it. I don't, I, I would have to dig it up, but it's, okay. I can point you to where you can find the answer. I don't, I don't have it off the top of my head. Sounds good. <laughs> so the, the other interpretation that I would, I would point out is Sprock, Sprock uses probably this, right here to make a generalization that circular temples are dedicated to Venus. Um, Carl Taube, on the other hand, says that circular temples are wind temples. And he he makes a you know, he he makes he uses a, an example, a good example of uh, a famous site that uh, mistakenly thought of as an equinox site. I mean, astro tourists and, and other people flock towards the Temple of the Seven Bells in Zibaltzumtun in northern Yucatan to watch the equinox sunrise through the doors of the Temple of the Seven Bells. But uh, Sprock's measurement of that temple shows that it, it's that's erroneous. It's not aligned to that. He claims that it's it's aligned to the setting sun on the quarter day, which is the temporal midpoint between solstices, which the Maya were aware of. But um, more yeah, that, that, that's a big offset. Yeah, it's a one degree offset actually. But yeah, it's pretty big. It's one degree at at the Temple of Dolls. Okay, but. But that structure is actually built upon a circular foundation. So there was a temple there that, and they build a circular foundation like this on top of. So Toby calls it a, um, a wind temple. But wind and rain are often associated uh, together in the Maya world. So I believe, I believe that both can be right. I believe it can be Venus and it can be wind. And I believe actually the Temple of Dolls is more. I believe it's actually also um, dedicated to the uh, water lily serpent and used as a portal between uh, cosmic realms are thought to be. But, but that's, that's certainly off topic. So there's other big circular temples too, but that um, are thought to be to Venus, and, and we'll look at those now. Of course, the most famous is the Caracol, Chichen Itza. So this is this is a Venus drawing up here. Uh, you probably have seen this before. I think I pulled it out of probably Skywatchers or something similar, where he talks about how the foundation of this building is askew and, and all these different uh, measurements to different things. Can't, I can't say that I subscribe to all of them. I probably, a lot of them though. Um, but the, the steps here, that this one points to the northernmost Venus setting, uh, or the northernmost Venus string <laughs> sets close to the summer solstice, which, which of course we saw in the last picture, it, it is close, a little bit further north. So there's a lot of, Proposed Venus alignments in this caracal of Chichen Itza. And one of its uh, supporting arguments here is that Delanda, uh, Diego Delanda, as he was going through and, and ripping up Maya land, uh, documenting as he destroyed it, uh, said that the caracal of Mayapan, which is 
just down the road from from Chichen Itza. They had their own caracol, and he reported that it was associated with the god Kukulkan, which of course was the Yucatec Maya version of Quetzalcoatl and the manifestation of uh, Venus. And then uh, Sprock mentions also to the Castillo of Palmol, which was a similar structure to these other two caracol towers. Um, the access from there was from the Northeast and it may have also oriented to, to Venus, but it's in such a state of disrepair that any measurements would just be uh, rough measurements at best, and unsubstantiated, unable to be substantiated. Any questions for that guy? And then the last and the biggest, of course, is the palace of the governor, um, which um, Avini initially, you know, said that this was a view of the rising morning star from a, over a peak far off in the distance. And, uh, and, you know, the, the key was the skew, right? You know, the entire city plan is, is aligned together. And then we have the skew, which tells us something must be going on. And there's a Venus altar that looks over, but um, it didn't quite work, didn't quite work. So it was revisited by Sprock and, and he has, that in this paper as well that actually the viewing point was out here and this was to watch the setting um, evening star at its maximum um, elongation in the west What's so here's the point for that i'm sorry could you re repeat that please what was the viewpoint for that the, ob the observation location uh, from behind the palace of the governors, what would you be standing wow. on? Or okay, so, so it's very much in the distance. It's not, it's not in Ushmal. It is, so let me find the actual name of it. It's the central pyramid of a totally different uh, polity. It's currently un- excavated and uh, it's called Ketsuk. So on, on the Sprock paper, he talks about it on page 40, 45 and 47, uh, like Ketsuk. There's also another really good write up on it and um, it's unattainably expensive. Uh, but if you have access to, uh, you know, the, the handbook of archaeoastronomy and ethnoastronomy that, you know, some of these guys are contributing authors to, uh, Sprock has a very good paper on the Palace of Governor and all the reasoning behind the, the new interpretation. And a lot of it has its, uh, has its roots here in his uh, master's thesis, which became the first of these two papers. And these two paragraphs kind of sum up his position. All great northerly extremes were seasonally fixed, coinciding approximately with the onset of the rainy season in Mesoamerica. So what he's saying is uh, when in this eight year cycle, Venus set at its northernmost extreme that coincided with the onset of the rainy season. And all Venus extremes are seasonal phenomena. And of course, the second point we already looked at, maximum extremes of morning star and evening star are asymmetric. Um, so are you saying, saying there's an eight year periodicity in rainy seasons? No. See, that one was tough for me to grasp too, grapple with. But he's saying when it occurs, it's always seasonal, right? Not that it happens every every solar year, but when it happens, that's my understanding of his position. 
Oh. I, you know, right, because it, because of course, you know, the 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 Venus cycle is much more than one year, right? Mm -hmm. you, know, it's, you know, it's five hundred and whatever days. So every time it every time it hits its northernmost extreme within that period, Sprock says that it marks it's a seasonal marker to the onset of the rain season. Yep, that, that one takes some thinking about. Yeah. I've read it in three or four different papers and it slid past me a couple times. So I think thought that it, I, I got a good grasp on it. But here's a, here's a here's a, another good one that I pulled out directly out of the Sprock paper. Many years ago, Seller observed that the temples consecrated to the planet Venus face west. The statement should nowadays be corrected. The facades of round temples of Quetzalcoatl, Kukulkan, are oriented to the west on the Yucatan Peninsula, whereas in central Mexico, they look east. The governor's palaces are small, evidently associated with Venus, also has access from the east. In spite of these dissimilarities, it can be said that all alignments to Venus extremes known so far refer to the extremes of the evening star visible on the western horizon. It appears that the placement of entrance or stairways does not indicate the direction of astronomical rank. So, I mean, that's right there. That's the majority of, you know, there, there may be a couple others to mention, but that's the majority of architectural orientations to Venus that I'm aware of. And outside of the Maya world, you know, where we looked at the we looked at the complexity of the of the um, Venus Almanac, which was probably composed very near uh, the Caracol of Chichen Itza, where they could have actually possibly even, you know, tested it or used that in the writing of their almanacs. Outside of Outside of that kind of connection, I think uh, Venus alignments would be very, uh, I'd be very skeptical of them without that layer of corroborating evidence. So this is, this is my last slide that I put together. Um, it's just a summary uh, to minimize this of some of the main points that uh, I either talked about or didn't talk about. The rain, the Venus rain maze complex is part of a, a greater Meso, Mesoamerican worldview, which regards time as a, cycl, as a cyclical cosmological process of life, death, rebirth, re death, rebirth, and so, and so on. In the hierarchical Mesoamerican societies, the Venus calendar would have been the purview of specialized elites. That's who would have been doing the observation. Uh, reading the almanacs, making the um, the prognostications. The blood sacrifices were linked to fertility and rain. Architectural orientations to Venus pointed to the northernmost extreme of the evening star in the west and coincided with the rainy season. The war-related practices of the American Southwest, which may have been the seeds of ritual conflict, were likely due to a movement of people and or ideas, not supposed to say ideas, northward after 1050 AD. Uh, the story of Patlakwopi, which is talked about in the beginning of the first paper, preserved the linkage between the feathered serpent and the star deity of Venus. Taking scalps was closely associated with rain and moisture, much like the blood sacrifices were in Mesoamerica. And the broader conceptual link between warfare and agricultural fertility is key to understanding the Venus morning star imagery in prehistoric Pueblo iconography. And lastly, although the calendrical elements were lost, the Venus cosmology was incorporated into Pueblo ideology because it was perceived as socially and economically useful and effective in rainmaking endeavors. So, that's all I had 
anybody has questions or comments. Uh, Chris, I would say bravo. You, you, you encapsulate so much information. Uh, what happened in 1050? Well, in the your, Ohio your, middle, world, your middle bullet. Mm -hmm. um, the Maya, the Maya classical world collapsed really. Okay. So we, we still don't know why. Um, the last, the last inscription it took call was around in the late eighth century. I think the last, last one was in the early nine hundreds. People just abandoned the cities. Um, they abandoned kingship mostly. So there's been a lot of uh, speculation. Was it drought? You know, was it was it a revolt? Was but, it, but, this, but this somehow brought warfare to the southwest. This is this is a fascinating thought. Well, maybe not. Not I'm not saying warfare per se, but ritualized warfare for sure. Right? What, what what is ritualized warfare? Okay, so the Maya the Maya needed captives to sacrifice. Right? Yes. So, so did the Aztecs. The Aztecs believe that they did not sacrifice somebody on, on one of their sunstones, then the sun would stop going around and that would be the end of everything. So uh, there's a, a, a theory, a prevailing theory, theory that warfare, one of the main reasons of warfare was the acquisition of captives. Mm -hmm. For sacrifices. Yeah, for just this purpose. And, yeah. and not just any captive, right? It had to be somebody, you know, <clears throat> You know, on the battlefield, people die, but a prince or something, or a, or a Columte or a Bacab, somebody like that would be taken back, possibly even kept prisoner for years and years before they were eventually sacrificed. Um, so that was part of it. Uh, bloodletting, royal bloodletting was, was part of it. I mean, the kings, kings didn't have a great job, really. A lot of the inscriptions you'll see are the, are the reliefs you'll see are kings um, perforating their penises with stingray spines to draw blood. They would drip on scrolls, which they would burn. Um, so this bloodletting was an important thing. Um, sometimes it was from the ruling class, sometimes it was a captured person. But it seems, uh, you know, what, what's probably saying in this paper is that the taking of scalps was uh, related to that, right? It, it, it grew out of that earlier Mesoamerican antecedent. And it's still wrapped up in, um, you know, rain and fertility and agriculture, all wrapped, you know, all wrapped around the, you know, Venus as being manifestation of the uh, Do you think we understand well enough the uh, migration of Mesoamerican ideas to the Southwest? I think we understand them enough, no, but, um, you know. I don't either. I, th I, think, we, I think there's a lot to, to be mined still. Yeah, I mean, there's, of course, we, we know that a lot of trade from Mesoamerica ended up at, at Chaco Canyon, right? And we've known that for, for a long time. But interestingly, um, Tim Pocket, if you're familiar with the work of Tim Pocket at, at Cahokia. I have heard he has, of that. Yeah. He has a great book called Archaeology of the Cosmos, where he talks about um, Cahokia and, you know, he goes into some, uh, some things that I, I think are shaky ground, like he does a lot of lunar alignment stuff that I may be skeptical of. I'm skeptical whenever anybody says minor and lunar standstill. But his new work actually is talking about um, circular temples in the Cahokia region. Mm. Now, these may have uh, traveled north from Mesoamerica as well. 